Hello, everyone. This is Timothy Mart with Alexandria. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing okay today. And that was our theme song by Ryan Duttery out of the UK. Uh, his website is Ryan Duttery dash music.com and he's on Twitter as well and so what we would like to talk about today well what we're going to talk about today is we have a very special guest okay so we have a very special guest today Bishop Brian Olette and uh, he's out of Atlanta Georgia and uh, he will be joining us today and we got a lot of questions for him originally this was supposed to be our first live show but uh, due to the storms that has hit Texas, we've had some technical issues, and this will not be a live show. This is actually a recorded show. So actually, if you look at your screen right now, you will see uh, pictures of some of the devastation on Texas uh, that has hit Texas pretty bad. As a matter of fact, some people were told they cannot flush their toilets or take showers, and so... Uh, everybody's been talking about Florida, but it seems like nobody's really been talking about Texas that much. But, um, so yeah, we have uh, Bishop Brian Olet today. And uh, we are the Tickle Trunk of Horrors show. And our website is TickleTrunkOfHorrors.com. And uh, the Gmail for that is TickleTrunkOfHorrors at Gmail.com. And we are also World Paranormal Research Society. And our Gmail for that is World Paranormal Research Society at gmail.com. And so that's also the name of our YouTube channel. And you're probably listening to this on the YouTube channel or watching it, etc. So, yeah. We apologize to everybody out there with, that it was excited about a live show, but uh, Mother Nature is Mother Nature, as we all know. We can't predict uh, Mother Nature, and I can tell you, folks, we just had water coming out of our yin yang, and I've never seen so much water. It rained and rained and rained. We really couldn't keep up with the water, and we were flooded out at one point too. And we're still doing a bit of a cleanup in regards to the water, the moisture, and it's still raining today in fact and uh, I've never been I never you know who would think that uh, Texas would have monsoon uh, type of rain and I know the people that were near the Llano River you could see it all over the news there was a, a, a even a trailer park that completely washed Junction, away Junction, Junction. R, it's not a trailer park it's actually Junction RV Park and the Junction RV Park is uh was completely wiped out and four people went missing we mentioned that in the last podcast show hopefully those people have been recovered i don't know we've been dealing with our own issues here and uh yeah it's just it's devastating it seems like 2018 uh has been a year of natural disasters all over the world and uh, the United States and Canada have not been uh, exempt or immune from it and we just have to have patience and trust in God that uh, we'll be okay and again nothing can uh, uh, stand in the way of mother nature and it is what it is and we just have to make do we just have to pull up our socks and just uh, on with the show and uh, and in show business it is that's the saying is on with the show there's a lot of mishaps that happen we just got to grin and bear it and just carry on and I, I would like to talk about something too um uh in, in all upcoming shows any of our guests that are psychics mediums or reiki masters or priests we will be doing our due diligence to uh to make sure that we research these people to make sure that they are at least working in the field or in uh practicing in the field um I'm getting tired of actually being talking to so many Reiki masters. Now there is a show called The Dead Files, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. And Amy Allen uh, is the first person I've ever heard in the United States of America mention a Reiki master on television. And uh, it seems like after The Dead Files started doing that, uh, now you got you're talking about out the yin yang now you got reiki masters out of the yin yang and so uh my whole problem with that is that we want to make sure that we verify these people so as uh, you know we research 90 percent of our past guests there is a 10 percent there who during an interview 
that we were interviewing them for something else they threw in that they were a Reiki master you'd have to do your own research if you're looking at doing business with any of the past guests that claim to be that and make sure that they are in fact a Reiki master and we will be talking with Bishop Brian Olette on the Reiki master situation and uh, just get his feelings on it and also what I like to mention is he is an exorcist and a lot of people say this in exorcism do you have to be a priest to perform an exorcism the answer to that question is no if you believe in God no matter what faith you are as long as you use the Holy Bible the and you believe in God God says the power of the word there's power in the word the power of your tongue holds the power of life and death so if you know the words to say the the the, the things to do during an exorcism and we'll have a two-hour special on exorcisms coming up soon but if you if you know what to do then you can do it you do not have to be a priest in minute somebody thinks about being uh, uh, some an exorcism needs to be done the first thought that comes to people's mind is oh we need to get a Catholic priest that is not true now there's different faiths that believe different things if you are of the Catholic faith then your your faith will tell you your belief system would be not not Catholic faith but Catholic religion then your, your, your faith would tell you that you need a Catholic priest to perform the exorcism. But however, the power is in the word. Catholic priests are good at exorcisms because they, certain Catholic priests, not all certain, because they practice, rehearse, and they've done them before. But there's many different religious faiths out there. There's many different religions that uh, have their own rules for exorcisms. So you'd have to refer to whichever religious view that you're pro that you're practicing. However, if you try to perform an exorcism and you do not know the words or do not know what you're doing, then they can be dangerous. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm guessing that Bishop Brian Olette's going to recommend that a priest do it. Exactly. And like I said, we'll be touching on that in a future episode. And uh, again, we always like to thank all of our fans and all of our listeners. Uh, I, I think one thing that you're going to notice about our show that kind of sets us above the rest is that, you know, we're off the cuff. We're unscripted and we're really going to tell you like it is because we're not going to sugarcoat anything. We're not going to do anything because it's uh, what's in fashion or what all the rage right now. We're going to cover topics and we're going to have guests that uh, we're are... going to validate the guests. We're going to verify validate. Yes, I, a lot of because I'm getting sick of it, man. You, we get guests on here. They Reiki master this. They, they There's so many masters in so many different fields. And it really, if you're a master of one field, it takes so much of your time and so much effort. How can you master something, five different things? You're just throwing titles out there. And I think it's really a money grab. And, you know, just to put maybe that into layman's terms or maybe into perspective for a lot of you out there. I mean, I'm an empath. I was born with this uh, ability and I certainly uh, I don't try and be more than that because I can tell you folks being an empath is a gift yes and it is a curse but it, it can be very emotionally physically psychically spiritually debilitating at times so I certainly could not handle more than being an empath because I'm telling you uh, you know if anybody is aware of what being an empath is uh, it takes a lot out of you and uh, I'm not going to try and be this and that and all that and uh, I certainly didn't learn my ability on an online course or through reading books it was just something that I'm trying to develop a gift uh, that I've uh, I was born with so that's just what it is and uh, I, I certainly couldn't be anything other than that because that's almost like saying hey I'm a ninja and I'm a samurai at the same time or hey, I'm a I'm a Green Beret and a Navy SEAL at the same time. Uh, it's just like it, these people are doing this because it's a money grab. I'll be very cautious on using anyone's service who's claiming to be the master of more than one thing. You got to look at where are they getting their uh, their ability, where are they getting their education in these fields from. Uh, that is that would be something to research and look into because unfortunately there is websites out there 
that are just looking to make money that will certify you as a master of one thing or other as long as you buy their products and uh, you'll be legitimately certified and you might not know nothing about it I actually want to get a few of these Reiki masters on air and during one show and just expose them well you know it all comes down to folks let's let's just be real about this there's always somebody out there with their handout that is ready to take your money and they'll promise you the world for 1999 or whatever it is whatever gimmick is out there and I'm telling you it takes a lot more than a piece of paper to describe my abilities or to have a certificate on the wall yes if you're a doctor you're a lawyer you need to have this uh, these certificates uh, be certified or whatever but for somebody in the spiritual world I really don't think uh, having a diploma from this or that well, that would be better what you just said than what I said about Ninja and Samurai or Navy Seal and Green Beret. It would be better to put it in the equivalency of somebody telling you that they're a brain surgeon and they're also a lawyer. I mean, so if you look at how difficult it is to master some of these practices, if you're a Wiccan priestess, how can you be a Reiki master? We're not saying that none of these exist, people with these two different abilities. But I would definitely research the abilities. Where did they get their education from before you just take them at face value? And uh, like I said, 90% of our guests in the past have been researched. 10% have not as far as what, you know, we'd start off the show on one subject. And then later on during the show, they'd mention that there's something else. And so we cannot validate or verify that uh, second secondary skill set uh, on 10% of our past guests. However, for the future, we will not make that mistake again. And so, uh, and, and it is a very costly uh, mistake to make. You just cannot take anybody's word for this. They, you know, just and, can't. You know, a, a lot of people too, I mean, uh, it's just that they feel compelled or it's almost like an addiction that gambling is uh, to, to go on these online courses and get certified. And I think I have to uh, encourage everybody to do your research exactly what is this online course are they even qualified to teach this online course and will your diploma your certification be worth anything anywhere else uh, is it worth the paper that it's printed no, on that's folks? just the thing even uh, the one of the websites I'm talking about I mentioned in a past show I'm not gonna mention again is uh, they don't even teach the course <laughs> what it is is uh, you buy the Reiki master material from them and then they list you as a Reiki master right at the same time that you bought the material. And so there is no course that you that you have to take through that organization. And then you have a little card that says that you're a Reiki master or whatever. And it's all BS. So uh, there's a lot more that goes into being something like that than uh, what people will tell you. I am a Judeo-Christian preacher. And uh, I, I've been preaching off and on for a long time, actually about 10 years now. And so I'll tell you that uh, I, I know the struggles it is uh, just, to, just to do what I'm doing, let alone trying to master something else. So I caution people who, there, there's a lot of people out there who realize that the paranormal is a big field today. And that uh, they just, uh, there's just a lot of people out there taking advantage of it and trying to get money. And I think it. that's what people, again, please, uh, err in the... Uh, just if you've got a gut feeling or err on the side of caution, there's so many people, like I've just stated earlier, that will take or fleece you for your last dollar. Do your research, folks. I know we're all on a quest for answers. We're going through maybe difficult times in our lives where we're seeking answers. Please, folks. Do, take the time uh, to do the research so you won't be disappointed because I know there's a lot of people out there that are on the paranormal bandwagon where, you know, it's so hip now to be a paranormal researcher and you've got people out there that have no clue how you have to prepare yourself what's really involved this is not a, a high school or a university uh, society or sorority where you can go to these haunted locations and start filming There's well, those are more hobbyists where if you look at par what paranormal researcher actually is 
is that you're taking all the data that you gather and you're taking that data and you can collect it into files and you're researching those locations there's a lot of hobby ghost hunters that go to just record an EVP or use night vision equipment they're hobby ghost hunters that's way different than paranormal research and uh, we, we are a world paranormal research uh, society so we do at legitimate paranormal research if you go back and look at a video that I've had so much criticism on which is uh, the gateway to hell the Austin Pizza Garden which is an investigation we did in Austin Texas uh, I, I used uh, a lot of different uh, means of investigating that are not, people are not used to seeing on television and so they would say well you know this this and I use a lot of thermal imagery things of that nature and uh, people are not used to uh, viewing that and they're not realizing that that was paranormal research I didn't really do it for our audience I was doing it for myself but I put it out there for the people to look at because it is a very haunted location and I think people again once you can wrap your head around the simplicity of it's just not the glamour of being in front of a, a camera with your makeup and your hair just right. There's a lot of behind it. Most of the work is behind the scenes. You're editing footage hours and listening to EVPs. I mean, that's dedication where you're ready to pull your hair out because you're going back and forth on different segments. So it's just not the photo op, the glamour about going to these high profile locations there's a lot of hard work dedication and you really have to pay your dues when you're in the paranormal world it's just not having a pretty face in front of a camera folks how many 20 year olds out there are Wiccan priestess and uh, and, and Reiki masters I mean that's just a joke but my, my thing is this uh, we have a Bishop Brian Olette on the show he is actually an exorcist he is a really a bishop and uh, and he practices what he preaches and I'm gonna tell you that he actually runs a podcast show as well and it would be awesome for you to check out his podcast show and it is called vestiges after dark and uh, vestiges after dark he covers a lot of material uh, on his podcast show so anybody that's a fan of his that is tuning into this show for the reason of, of hearing Bishop Brian Olette then yeah, check out uh, check out his podcast show Vestiges After Dark, and uh, it, it, I mean it's an awesome show, and you'll be able to uh, to learn a lot from him. And I know coming up, just while we're talking about live shows, that uh, Bishop uh, Brian Olette will actually be a part of uh, the Ghost Adventures Live as well. They're having an event, I believe it's on uh, Halloween, and he's going to be involved in uh, Ghost Adventures Live as well. And uh, I well, just... Well, I'm going to be honest with you, I could care not, not, not so much about that. It's great he's going to be on TV with Ghost Adventures crew. That's not why we have him on the podcast. We have him on the podcast because he is an exorcist and he has a lot of knowledge and we want to learn from him. And actually, again, he is a, an exorcist bishop for all of you out there that are not familiar for the old Catholic order of exorcists. He's a metaphysicist and also an esotericist as well and uh, you know he runs the he's out of Atlanta Georgia and he is uh, he runs or he's part of the Holy Nickelodeon Catholic Church is it the Catholic Church Holy Nickelodeon Catholic Church oh, okay well uh, it's uh, uh, that's I thought what, the last time we interviewed him he said that it wasn't no it's that's the name of the church that's okay. where his website is I'm off right off of his website okay and uh, it's an independent apostolic esoteric Catholic Church okay and so uh, yeah and he, he he's the real deal when we use the word real deal uh, he is the real deal and I'm sure that's why Zach and them are using him and that's great he's gonna be on the show uh, it's a show that I really don't watch that much anymore so uh, you know but uh, Bishop Brian Olette very educated man very trained in the manners of exorcism and uh, very can can educate you on a lot of things as far as religion goes and that's somebody to really learn from if you're a true paranormal researcher that wants to learn and not a hobbyist ghost hunter who's just into what can you get on TV so yeah. exactly and I think it's uh, it's always good to 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 
get different perspectives on things and uh, you know we like our listeners uh, to learn new things and uh, actually this is a statement and we're going to ask uh, Bishop Oled about this. Uh, he made a tweet about this where he's saying this statement and we're going to ask him to elaborate on this where he say, says that exorcism ministry is 5% expelling demons uh, and uh, expelling demons and 95% is convincing people that unless they surrender their life entirely over to Christ, they will never truly be rid of their demonic afflictions. Right, because if your body is filled with the Holy Spirit, the demons cannot destroy you, hurt you, or possess you. And so that is the thing to keep in mind. A lot of people that play as a hobby ghost hunter, they uh, they don't, they've never, a lot of people ain't even never read the Bible. And so the Bible is your most important tool to have in your toolkit for anything that you're doing like this. I mean, it's, it's a tool to have. It's, you know, you got your EVP recorder, you got your night vision camera, and you also need to have your Bible. I mean, and don't take nobody's word for what's in the Bible. Uh, what you need to do is actually read the Bible with your own eyes and seek and, and see what it's saying with your own understanding uh, churches and priests and preachers are there to help guide you and uh, but you you definitely it's not a substitute for your relationship your personal relationship with God and getting to know God uh, through the word and I think we found that out through uh, our experience with paranormal research. We had a location in regards to the homeowners or the people that were inhabiting this location refused to change their ways. And right. we had gone to that location twice. And if you don't have somebody uh, that was willing to change either drug habits, alcohol, or just the lifestyle they're living, you could be there every single day and you're really not going to make a difference. It's just like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And I'm not going to name no names about these people at this location. What I will say is that they were using the church for financial gain. But when we went to go do cleanse their house because they they had a lot of poltergeist activity in the home and again i'm not going to mention the location but uh when you one of the things that we noticed was that they were playing on the heartstrings of some of these churches in order to get money from the churches but in reality the way and we can say this because the first time we stayed we did i think it was a week the second time it was two weeks so mm -hmm. we, we have a total of three weeks at this one location and and so we got to know them fairly well and i did not see them at all trying to get to know god or at all trying to seek the word or read the word and seek god through the word and so you know yet they wanted us to keep helping them and it come a time where we just had to cut them off and wash our hands of them we cleansed their home several times and they kept bringing demons back into the home because of the lifestyle that they were living they were really serving satan but being financed by churches and that's a shame I mean that's just another example of people not wanting to help themselves and it's just like anybody that has addictions you can't help somebody unless they're willing to help themselves and it's the same way if somebody is not ready to receive the gift of God you you can't make any headway there's people that unless they're ready there's not a darn thing you can do about it and you just hope and pray that one day they're gonna find their way before it's too late and something awful happens in their life it's just a shame yeah it is it's, it's a shame that people do not want to get to know God and they think it's cool to rebel against the Word of God let me say this there's traditional Christianity and when I say that I say traditional Christianity and what, what your grandma and your mom taught you and what a pastor spoon fed you and then there's real Christianity the real Christianity being that you read the, the Bible yourself you, you're actually living a life that's pleasing to God and that you're, uh, you're going to church for the right reasons and you're trying to live live away you know you you want to you want to do things that feed your spirit 
And so it's, it's great to go out and see horror films or listen to whatever type of music or whatever like that for entertainment purposes, if that's what you choose to do. But you also need to do things, because those things are not feeding your spirit. You also need to do things that are going to feed your spirit. You need to listen to the gospel songs. You need to read the Bible. What, what, if you go watch a horror movie, watch a, watch a gospel movie. Watch a, mo a Bible movie. Watch something that's uh, related to the history of the Word of God. The History Channel, National Geographic, and Discovery Channels, they've all did uh, documentaries based on biblical locations and things of that nature. And those are some of the things that I would recommend that you use to help try to feed and strengthen your spirit. In other words, folks, to put that into perspective, there always has to be work that has to be done. Nobody's going to get a free ride in this life. And if you think you're not going to be able to accomplish anything worthwhile without any kind of an effort, you're sadly mistaken. Because anything that's worthwhile in this lifetime is going to require some work on your part. You're going to have to roll up your hands and you're really going to have to do some work. There's just no way around it and there's no easy ride or there's no free ride through life, folks. So yeah. let's just be honest about that. And, uh, you know, once you can come to that realization, I think things will be a little bit easier. If you make $400 a week, $40 of that should be going to something that would please God. And uh, if you have a home, 10% of your home should should have items in it. I think this is probably Bishop. Hold on for one second. Hello, welcome to the Turkey Trunk of Horror Show. Is this Bishop Brian Olet? It sure is. How you doing? How you doing, man? It's been a long time since we talked to you. A few months there, huh? It has. It has. And and since since that time, what we notice is that you have a podcast show of your own called Vestiges After Dark. Yeah, it's an extension of my other one, Vestiges of Christianity. Um, you know, Vestiges of Christianity that has been on and off for the past several years, but it's mostly a theological show. Uh, whereas Vestiges After Dark is more of a paranormal um, focused show, gets into less of the religion and more into the supernatural. Yeah, and uh, we, we, we've already explained to the people listening that, uh, and we are going to put up photos and stuff too about what, what's happened here in Texas as far as the storms go, because this originally was supposed to be a live show. And uh, we've had some technical issues where it's going to have, now it's being a recorded show, but. I think when people see the devastation through the photographs, they will understand why this is a recorded show. So we do appreciate you joining us. And uh, one of the things that we would like to talk about with you, go more into detail with you on, is because uh, you are an exorcist, is on exorcisms. Sure. And so, uh, you know, what, uh, there's a lot of questions uh, out there that people have. And uh, like, as far as if, if you want an exorcism performed or you want to uh, or somebody needs an exorcism performed uh, what is the best recommendation that you recommend because there's a lot of different religions out there a lot of different faith groups that's going to have different methods of doing it what's the best way that you recommend that people get started in seeking for that to happen well, I think it's important for a person to seek the help of somebody that at least matches their worldview. I do think there is some value in seeking the help of somebody that is already that already shares your particular focus or philosophical vantage point. Not that it wouldn't be a, not that another alternative method wouldn't be effective. It's just there is a certain element of exorcism ministry, regardless of whether it's of the Christian variety or some other form, and that multiple religions, uh, as I've talked about numerous times on various other talk shows, you know, numerous religions have uh, a framework for exorcism. They have different explanations, different methodologies, as you've noted, but, you know, the one thing that they all have in common is the recognition that there is a supernatural force that can be malevolent or harmful to our existence and there is on occasion a need to extract and eliminate that force. That's what exorcism ministry is. But what isn't talked about as much is that exorcism requires the participation of the victim. It requires their participation 
information in the very work of extraction. And if a client or a victim, however you want to classify them, you know, isn't uh, you know really motivated by the religious or spiritual worldview in which is trying to help them, it's not going to have the same impact as somebody that would be invested in that solution. So I find that the best advice that I can give is to work with somebody that at least matches your philosophical take on spirituality, uh, because that's going to help you a great deal. That being said, not all methods are as equally as effective as others. And I can say, and it's not my bias, being a, you know, a Catholic bishop, um, but I have explored and studied numerous methods out there, and I can say that nothing that I have seen has been more effective than the, the Roman ritual of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it is, without a doubt, the most powerful, the most efficacious, um, but even it has limitations when the person who's receiving it doesn't take into full consideration or doesn't fully embrace the religious obligations that come with being a Catholic. You know, I, I sometimes in this ministry, because we are open to all denominations uh, of Christianity as well as non-Christian groups, we'll, help, we'll try at least to help anybody. Um, I, I can tell you that in my own personal experience, uh, there are numerous non-denominational Christians that come to us thinking that I can say some magical incantation and make all their spiritual problems go away, while at the same time they're not having to do anything to help to facilitate the grace that they're asking for. And what that means is you have to be committed to a religious path in order to really get the power that you need to fight this type of thing. So to use an analogy that I've used before, but it's just so perfect, it's such a perfect parallel, there's really no better one to use. An exorcist is not any different than a first responder. When you are having a heart attack, they call 911, the paramedics get into that ambulance, and they rush over to save their life. And they will use CPR, they'll use other you know, methods or technology at their disposal to prevent you from dying. But that's not where it ends. It's not like, okay, here's your CPR, now you can go home. You know, you have to be brought to the hospital. Further tests and evaluation need to be done. Then you need to see a cardiologist or other specialist. And then, ultimately, they have to get to the cause of what, 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 where did this heart attack come from in the first place? Maybe it's a bad diet, and now you need a change of lifestyle. All of that necessary in order to find the type of spiritual healing that exorcism ministry provides. So when we're looking at the overall prognosis of any particular case, what we're looking at is how compliant is that client going to be with our aftercare instructions, because ultimately that's where the healing really takes place. I can get rid of any immediate demonic attack very effortlessly relatively speaking. So, so, I cannot stop that demon from coming back if you're not willing to do your side of the work. Exactly. So what you're, what you're saying is that after, after you perform the exorcism, people do need to get into the church, start seeking God, and start living a more spiritual life, correct? Yeah, or at least whatever the equivalent is for the particular world or religion they belong to. Um, you know, they're these rights exist for a reason. Participation of laity in these spiritual rights occurs for a reason. It's not just for priests and ministers and, you know, various other types of clerical people like Buddhist monks. It, you know, it's all of us. We have to participate in it. In Buddhism, it's called the Sangha, you know. In Christianity, it's the church. The church isn't the building. The church isn't the administration, the church isn't the, the rules and the canon law. The church is the people, and we all belong to it in some capacity. So for a Christian to seek the help of a Catholic exorcist, they better be prepared to start coming to, to Mass.
Mass, then receiving those sacraments, going to Eucharist, or if you, you know, going to confession, these are things that are going to ultimately uh, uh, resolve the problem. The exorcist just starts the healing, but they have to be the ones to finish it. Right, right. And so that's that's completely understandable. I was noticing that on, on one of your uh, shows that you did on your uh, Vestiges After Dark, you were talking about cursed objects. And we did a paranormal investigation that we were referring to uh, where a location where people were bringing in estate objects from different places into their home. And we believe that some of those objects were cursed. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit of that? Uh, for us on this show? Yeah, a cursed object tends to occur when an individual um, either acquires a inanimate object of some kind, although I have to say that technically speaking, a cursed object can be anything, even a human being. Um, it's just we don't call them cursed objects at that point. That's when we start to refer to them as demonically oppressed or even possessed. Um, but you know, when an object, be it a human being or uh, anything else, or, you know, a rock or, you know, piece of furniture, piece of clothing, for example, you know, receives the demonic attachment, you know, at that point, it is the equivalent of what we would call a cursed object. Um, and the reason we use the word curse is perhaps a bit misleading, because uh, a curse in the traditional sense, there's only one way in which an object can receive that type of attachment, where a person uses some type of occult ritual, whether it be some kind of dark form of witchcraft or voodoo, where they would infuse a malicious spirit to an object. Um, that, that, that That's just one way in which it can happen. It can happen numerous other ways. For example, it can happen because there is a dark uh, event that took place in a particular location that that object happened to be in close proximity to. Like, for example, uh, a I can guarantee you the, the, the tragedy that occurred in Las Vegas um, from the Mandalay Bay uh, massacre, um, I, can, I can tell you without any question that that ground now has numerous cursed objects associated with it. No question. Because all of that trauma gets trapped energetically in the surrounding environment and the various objects that happen to be there. Now that's not witchcraft, that's not somebody going out there to send a curse, it's just it's a cursed event that eventually gets infused into the local environment. Same thing can happen when a person is uh, traumatized. Um, for example, if a person is, uh, um, you know, uh, sexually assaulted, um, if that happens in a particular home and it happens day in and day out in that same place, then eventually that home and all the objects in it can become infused with that dark energy. And it will create a demonic sentience that can go out and inflict harm on other people who come in contact with those objects. So that's essentially what a cursed object is and, and how it happens. Awesome. We, we really love your explanation there. And uh, one of the things that I would like to also talk about is uh, we've had a lot of guests on our shows where it seems very unfortunate that uh, almost in the middle of the podcast, they'll throw out there that they're a Reiki master. And uh, one of the things that, uh, and we just talked about it before, before you called in, was that I've interviewed so many Reiki masters, it's crazy. And I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm finding it hard to believe that all of these people are actually masters of Reiki. Uh, and I've never heard of it until the show Dead Files started to come on. And uh, that's the first time I'd ever heard of a Reiki master. And now everybody in America who's into the paranormal that's a female seems to be a Reiki master. It is a problem. And, you know, it's something that has come up uh, recently on my Twitter. Um, people on Twitter will ask me all sorts of various questions that range the entire spectrum of paranormal data. And uh, right 
Mikey has come up on more than one occasion, and I do speak uh, relatively negative about it. Not that I have anything against Ricky as a course of study. I have everything against malpractice in a spiritual sense. And the only reason that they can get away with it is because there's no regulation at all within these types of fields. So it's kind of an alternative healing methodology. Um, there is some merit to it, but the level of study and the, uh, the level of, or the, the demonstrated level, I should say, of proficiency that would be required to gain the title of master um, is not, on, in general, uh, being uh, being a, uh, a, or not resulting from most of these courses. So there's all sorts of certifications that a person can go online and you know do some kind of online study and and then pay some kind of fee and then get a certificate that says they're a master. There's some more formal or even more traditional methods where they would actually study under a person who's already a master, but the problem with even those programs is that you don't know where they got their title from. Did they really follow in the steps of the traditional master or not? And in most cases, they have not. In fact, I would go as far as to say, and I get in a lot of trouble when I say this, but I really don't care. Um, I would challenge anybody to truly refute me and find data to, to, to say that I'm wrong. Uh, there really isn't a genuine program that I would trust outside of Japan. And, uh, you know, there was really only one Reiki master, and that would have been, you know, Usui. I think, that, I think, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, who was the one that developed the methodology. And understand that, you know, he comes from basically a, a Shinto mystical background with a strong focus on Buddhism and Taoism and other Eastern philosophies that uh, he found attractive. He even studied Western religion, which is why you see uh, a, a lot of people claiming that Reiki somehow is how Jesus healed people. I mean, this is all a bunch of New Age nonsense. Um, you know, I, I get offended when people equate Reiki to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because it's not the same thing. Um, Reiki requires the ability to use your will to effectuate change in the vibrational resonance of a person's energy field, which the Chinese would call qi. This is the framework of most Chinese medicine. Um, it's more or less how acupuncture works and these alternative healing techniques. And, and there is truth to that. I mean, I certainly, I use uh, acupuncture myself. I, I swear by it. Uh, I have had great results from it. So there, there is definitely truth to the metaphysics behind the uh, Eastern studies. However, that being said, the level of skill and education that's required to be an acupuncturist, you know, is particularly a classically trained one from China, is far beyond what most people in the West would ever commit to. So, you know, you gotta understand that that the original Reiki master, you know, was a was, a, was basically a monk, and he dedicated his life to meditation and very strict study of, of or in practice of uh, uh, a very high level spirituality. They're not teaching that at these, at these seminars here in the United States and handing out certificates for, you know, sometimes a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars to, to get this master designation. Um, you know, so to me, it's very dubious. It's very dangerous. Um, I don't, I wouldn't trust any of it. There's just too much fraud in the field. Uh, and like you said, Everybody seems to claim to be a Reiki master. Why are they that? Well, because anybody can become. You can self-declare it. Who's going to stop you? You know. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you that uh, there is a uh, website online, and I'm not going to mention the name of it, but it's a it's a ministry, and uh, the ministry for twenty nine ninety nine, you can order a Reiki, a Reiki book, and they'll give they'll send you a card that says that you're a Reiki master, and so uh, right, twenty nine. 
yeah I, I, I'll actually if you want I can actually email you the link to that if you want to look at it but I don't want to mention it in the podcast I don't want to encourage people to go get this card but it's uh for 20 sure. for, for 20 they'll they'll make you a Reiki master and so that's uh to me that's a, just a yeah, joke I would, love if you, I would love it if you could send that to me please do yeah we'll, we'll definitely send it to you and uh I, I'm glad that you spoke on it because you're probably the most uh, rep- reputable person to speak on this. And it's been bothering us that so many people that we've talked to are Reiki masters. And I've never heard of it before the, that show that's on TV now. But anyway. Uh, yeah. And I think what, what I like to talk to people about and I think people are having a hard time is just like with in life in general, everybody's looking for that easy button to press and they just want to cruise through life or maybe any kind of situation that they're facing by just pressing an easy button and then everything is going to be magically solved and uh, you know not realizing that sometimes we have to roll up our sleeves we got to get our hands dirty we got to dig in and we got to actually work you know it's such a valid point and i really think it hits the nail on the head it also explains to a large degree why there is such a falling away of traditional religion today and why people are finding more new age or new agey type uh religions to be more attractive um, because they're easier. They don't, there's no accountability. All you have to do is just buy a book and make all sorts of declarations you want. No one's going to challenge you on it. Anyone can claim anything. And, um, and it comes down to, well, this is what I believe, and I have a right to believe what I want to believe, and that's where it begins and ends. They don't want to have some authority telling them that they might be wrong. And so this is what makes traditional religion so difficult, is that there's rules to follow. There's an expectation that must be met. Um, And nobody wants these days, people don't want to deal with a God that requires something of them. They would much rather just make it up as they go along. It's a lot less on your conscience when you don't have to worry about doing it the wrong way. Tolerance is like the blind leading the blind. And, you know, there is ultimately a right way and a wrong way to do certain things. Now, there might be multiple right ways, but there's, I can guarantee you, if there's a hundred right ways, there's probably two or three million wrong ways. So what are your odds that you're going to get the right one, particularly when you're looking for an easy solution like you're talking about? So the same thing goes with even, you know, exorcism ministry, and we find it all the time. People looking for easy outs. The exorcist can do all the work for them, and then um, they don't have to do it. They don't need to commit to going to church every Sunday. I don't have time for that. I've got too many other things that I need to be doing, and I see it all the time. We get people that will come into the mission church here in Atlanta, and then they will, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sit with them. We will invest hours in them, all free of charge, by the way. We do take donations, but most people neglect to even feel obligated to give something. Or if they do give, it's usually marginal and not really enough to sustain the operations of the ministry, but we still meet with them. We still give them hours and hours of our time. And all we ask in return is not money. Just come to Mass. Come to Mass. Build your spiritual fortitude. Cultivate that grace that can only be received this way. I and think I think you're, you're right. Are obligated. Yeah. And yeah. Let, let me say this, Bishop. Is that exactly what you're saying? People don't want to spend any time uh, seeking God. Instead, they want to find a religion that makes their life easier or fits into their life instead of actually picking up the Bible and uh, spending time in a church and actually dedicating some time to seeking God. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. And um, that's an unfortunate byproduct of our you know, very uh, informal society. You know, we we live in a in a world now where we are we are obsessed with things being easy. Everything's about convenience. So, you know, religion is not immune. 
So if you're going to do a religion, it better be a convenient religion. Just like, you know, we need our fast food restaurants, even though they, they're, they're basically poisoning us. Um, we need our, um, well, you name it. You know, everything, we just want it all to be right there. Very simple. Technology is built upon making life easier. And, that, and so, while this is a natural human instinct, it's problematic when it comes to religion because God simply does not work that way. God is a challenge. And in order to reach the level of realization that would give you something like the title of Reiki Master, for example, you would have to dedicate decades of your life to finding those or, 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 or making it possible for you to access those realizations. That only comes with hard work and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And I've never known anyone who did religion correctly that found it easy or pleasurable the whole time. Yes, it does give you, you know, moments of great peace, uh, and that sustains you, but there's also moments of great trial. Um, and there's nothing in the Bible that says it's going to be easy, which is probably, again, why nobody wants to read it, because who wants to read that kind of inconvenient religious path when I can go pick up, you know, a, a New Age book at my New Age bookstore and, and basically it tells me everything I want to hear. And I think what, you, what you're saying is absolutely correct because what we find out or it's just like people on a quest to lose weight. You, there's no magic pill out there that you can pop and you can eat all the junk food in the world and you're going to lose weight. It's the same as paranormal researchers or an exorcist. People, when they call, they expect you to be that magic pill that once they ingest that pill, everything is rainbows and unicorns and they don't have to worry about a god darn thing. Yes, exactly right. And yes, weight loss is a wonderful parallel because you're right I mean why do people are why are they always looking for the next fad diet why are they always looking for some kind of uh, you know magic pill that claims to do all this fat burning and, 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 and what because they don't want to exercise it comes down to the fact that they don't want to be spending hours of the day in their their butts on a treadmill or on a bicycle or having to do something that requires work and effort and the same thing goes with religion, you know. But the thing is that just like, just like a healthy physical lifestyle that requires good diet and good exercise in order to maintain, you know, a um, good bodily health, the same thing is with the spirit. If we're not exercising our spiritual relationship to God, and it doesn't have to be Christian. Don't mis I don't want any of your your listeners to miss. Understand me. I'm not advocating that everyone has to just like abandon their religious path and, and, and convert to Christianity. That's not what I'm saying. But whatever divinity is to you, okay, if you're not willing to give all of yourself to it, which is going to be a hell of a lot of work, um, then you can't expect anything back from it. Because honestly, the way God works is He gives you just about as much as you give Him. If you don't feel that he's been very much a part of your life, it's probably because you've not been a big part. You've not made your life a big part about him. And it comes down to that. And I think another thing before we, we cover something else, too, is that, you know, people are so afraid of speaking the truth because they feel if they're going to end up speaking the truth, they're going to stand alone. I mean, I, I wrote a book recently where people wanted to join in with their personal stories in my book. And I thought, OK, more credibility to what I had to say about a government. But when it came down to the crunch time, nobody wanted to step forward for fear of being ostracized or well that's not what people want to hear so sometimes the truth can be a deterrent because people are afraid to stand up alone that's true I mean you well, you follow me on Twitter so you see the ramifications of many of the things that I say and you know I guess what makes me successful is that I don't really give a damn what people think I'm going to teach what is the right thing to teach um, you know, I, I, I would argue, and I have very good, a very good argument to support that what I teach is well established. It isn't made up. It's not that it's just some kind of weird idea that I came up with and I want to go out there and spew it on the social media. Um, you know, there's thousands of years of effort 
that went into the types of things that I relay on social media. So if a person has a problem with anything that I say, they better be prepared to go after thousands of years of dedicated and very educated people who gave us that information because it's not coming from me. It's just simply coming from, um, you know, the well-established formula that exists within uh, the Christian esoteric world. And, uh, you know, there's great material there. A lot of it's, you know, not accepted for various reasons. Um, but, again, it, you know, if they're, if they're not accepting it, it's because they're not paying attention to where it's coming from. You know, it, it, it's it's unfortunate that we have to have a society that's like this. But, you know, I, mean, I can't say anything without the traditionalists jumping down my back. Uh, you got you got the Church of Satan that jumps in every now and then. Um, you know, then we've got the set of the Cantus that are always after me. Then you got Roman Catholics that are always. I mean, I, I, I can say any. I can say the most benign thing on Twitter. And I will have every group out there down my throat for it. And the only way that you can function this way is to not care. And I don't care. They always have to refute me. They think that by refuting me somehow it's going to validate their point. It doesn't. I really don't care. I'm just going to go on there and I'm going to teach the best I can teach because I have seen what I've taught work. And that should be good enough because it was good enough for the last two or three thousand years of uh, of, of, of practitioners, and you know, I'm not teaching from some new age book. I'm teaching from ancient scriptural documents, old, uh, you know, extra canonical sources, uh, and as well as the the esoteric tradition. You know, and I, it's very valuable if, if a person is willing to commit to the work. But they have to be willing to commit to the work. Otherwise, forget it. They'll, they'll never. This is why these atheists have so much trouble. Hey, they, they always they, 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 they always want. They don't want us to. They always want to argue that God doesn't exist, but the fact of the matter is the reason they think that is because they're not willing to commit to the realization that are required to reach God. God's not going to come down to your level. You have to re raise yourself up to His, and they don't want to do that work. Hey, Bishop, a uh, uh, question for you. Like, as far as the Old Testament yeah. goes, like, what would be your favorite Old Testament story? Story. Um, you know, I I find at least from an esoteric vantage point, I, I think the Adam and Eve story is is remarkably well done. Um, it it's just confusing enough to upset a lot of people, <laughs> regardless of whether or not they are uh, believers of the Bible or people that have rejected it. Um, it is definitely a problematic theological story. The whole idea of why was evil in the garden to begin with? Why would us? Why would we have been even subjected to temptation if we were already perfect? Why would God have even allowed the chance for us to screw up the cosmos and create original sin? These are very deep, problematic stories. It even comes back to the whole, you know, modern arguments for the problem of evil, and a lot of atheists use these. Uh, albeit quite poorly, but they do use them as arguments for why God doesn't exist. And if he was, um, you know, uh, 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 if he was omnipotent, he'd be able to resolve evil just by simply willing it. Yet the fact that evil exists must prove that God isn't as powerful as we think he is, assuming he's even there at all. That's one of the things that you hear some of these individuals say. And it comes back to this idea of the Garden of Eden story. Like, why would Satan have been in there? Why would he even allow it in there um, in order to facilitate the temptation that led to original sin? And then, furthermore, why were we blamed? Why couldn't we? Ha why couldn't it have been argued that it wasn't unlike a manipulation of a, ver a ver much more sophisticated being? And Adam and Eve were basically like innocent toddlers who would not have understood the ramifications of anything that was being told to them by the serpent. Um, this is something that enriches our, our imaginations, and we say, well, why would this be? And the beauty of it is, from a, Jew, a Jewish point of view, it really doesn't make much sense. But once you understand the, the depth of Christian theology, then it becomes beautiful, because then we start to see that the reason God allowed this 
was so that we could reach him and have free will at the same time. Our will was not sophisticated enough to be able to make the right decision. And that's what we would need to be able to do to be at God's level. I mean, how could we ever reach God's level? Because he wants us. He doesn't need us. There's nothing we can do to add to his greatness. But he wants to be in relationship with us. And he wants that relationship to be free and equal. But how can it ever be free if there's no free will where we're being protected from every bad decision? That's not freedom. And furthermore, how can it be truly equal if we're not able to raise, you know, if we're just the lowly humans, the lowly aspect of his creation, but not rising up to his level. The way that that would need to happen is we'd have to fall, so that we could enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, which becomes the mediator between this God that's untouchable and the failure of the human race. He becomes this, this solution. So now, now we don't need to raise up to the level of a God that we can never achieve to. Now we can relate to another human being who is, who is God-made man. And so, you know, the Orthodox have this wonderful um, uh, saying, uh, Eastern Orthodox have this wonderful saying that says that, you know, God became man so that man can become God. And that's, that, that exemplifies the whole Adam and Eve story because why did he allow it to happen? So that we could fall and meet Christ and then freely choose him and then Christ through grace can raise us up to the level of God. We enter into the beatific vision, become one with God, enter into eternity and thus enjoy all the, the, the benefits of eternal life. That could not have occurred if we were perfect in the Garden of Eden because yes, while we were perfect, we also weren't free and we would never be equal to God. Now we have the option to achieve to that because of Jesus Christ, who shows us the way by dying ourselves. So the very consequence of the Garden of Eden story, which is death, we were, we were immortal, now we're no longer immortal, now we're mortal, and now we suffer and we die. So how do we conquer death? Well, we, we embrace suffering and death, and then we resurrect from it, like the phoenix from the ashes. Beautiful, beautiful theological story, and it's it so, so much... So many people don't understand it. So that's my favorite one. That's an awesome explanation, and it's a uh, yeah, very beautiful explanation. Let let be, being that it's the time of the year that it is, I would ask you if you do uh, participate in any Halloween festivities, or do you eat any Halloween candy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always been a, a big celebrator of Halloween. Um, I find it to be a wonderful holiday for me. Halloween is what really kickstarts the holiday season. It doesn't really feel like the holidays are beginning until Halloween has taken place, um, and it's not just the cooling down of the of the the atmosphere. It's also just the, the overall the first you know big holiday to start that. You know, that's on everybody's mind. You see the decorations of the stores. You get the trick-or-treaters and all of that, which I think is all a wonderful, delightful thing. We grew up doing it, and, you know, nobody had any problem with it. I, I mean, I grew up in a very roving Catholic town, um, you know, with Socket, Rhode Island. Uh, absolutely very, very roving Catholic up there. In fact, you know, there were other denominations, but you never really saw them. It was all Roman Catholic. And I mean, everybody trick-or-treated. Everybody. The church never said anything negative about it. It's only been in this modern day where people have started to associate it with the, the demonic, uh, uh, you know, the, the demonic associations and everything else. And, and I, I really think that a lot of that comes from the fact that people that are into Satanism, um, and people that are into darker forms of witchcraft, or even, you know, just into the, the neo-pagan uh, mindset, um, are really big into Halloween. In fact, a lot of them see that as almost their Christmas. And, um, and so I think that modern Christians are looking at that and saying, well, see, look, they're, they've kind of cleaned this holiday. But they're forgetting the fact that it is a Christian holiday. I mean, it, it's, it's the eve of it's the eve of all saints. That's what All Hallows Eve. It's because All Saints Day is November first, and then the day after that is All Souls Day, and um, and these 
are where these origins come from. Of course, you have, um, you know, the pagan calendar, but, uh, you know, I've, I've researched this extensively, and I cannot find really any, a, any reliable source that would, that would suggest that Halloween was anything other than a Christian holiday that had been developed some of the old, the, 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 the associations of the old world, which would have had some pagan uh, attributions. But, you know, again, in the old world, you know, people would have still maintained some of their folk beliefs, and that would have been integrated into their um, religious beliefs. And so, like, something like the jack o lantern for example, that all came about because it was um, believed that during this time of year, uh, you know, the, the, the souls of the dead could walk the earth. And that's, again, because it's a holy time, and that's also why the Church celebrates all saints and all souls together, back to back, like that, because it was the time where we are reminded of the dead, and we pray for the dead, and we pray for their release, because the unrested souls that are in limbo would still potentially be out there somewhere and not rested, which is, again, why we have tombstones that say rest in peace R.I.P. on them and now that's sort of an icon of Halloween uh, imagery but it all comes back to the idea of, of wanting the souls of the dead to find peace, to find peace in God um, and, the, and so the jack-o'-lantern was uh, this idea that if you if you, if you you put a um, sort of like, it operated like a gargoyle uh, it was a, almost an egregore that could protect you against evil spirits that might be lurking around, um, and it, it, it represented the light of Christ. Ironically, nobody associates jack-o'-lanterns today with the light of Christ, but that's essentially what their origin is. Um, you know, same thing with wearing Halloween costumes. That came about because it was believed that if you could put on uh, a disguise that looked like a spirit, which is why Halloween costumes tend to be darker images or more frightening looking things and uh, the whole idea of horror being associated with this time of year is because the more frightening you would look the more like a dark spirit you'd look and then they wouldn't think that you were anything special so they'd leave you alone um that's where it all comes from but it's all folk belief that got integrated into the the, the the church calendar so i don't have any problem with any of these things so yes i absolutely eat you know, the Halloween candy. I have a son. I make sure that he gets trick or treat every year. He loves it, enjoys it. He's never come home with a demonic attachment. <laughs> fa- fa- <laughs> that's awesome. Fa- favorite favorite candy, Bishop? Favorite candy. Um, well, if we're talking this generic Halloween candy, I think I would always have to say um, I, 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 it's a cross between mounds and Twix. Um, but if I could have any chocolate, it would have to be Godiva truffles. I, I have a weakness for those. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Awesome. And uh, when you're talking about, uh, it's interesting what you're mentioning about traditions and stuff, uh, because there's a lot of people, uh, especially where I'm from in Canada, we have a, a mumming or a mummer festival, and that really became, uh, it's still uh, big in Newfoundland. Uh, it was outlawed for a while, and I think in 2009 they just brought uh, the Mummer Festival back, and that actually was a festival that happened uh, the 12 days of Christmas where people would dress up in costumes, uh, everything was topsy-turvy, reversal, and you'd go down to knock on your neighbor's door to see if they would recognize you, and they would give you, a lot of times back in the day, it was either gin or it would have been rum, it was more for the adults were they'd uh, dress in the costumes and you know kind of have frolicky and all that and soul cakes or even souling as well. Oh yeah, yeah. See that, and I find that I find all of that beautiful. Um, I really think we as a species take ourselves way too seriously, and the two elements of our lives in which we do that is going to be politics and religion. Um, and, you know, religion is, should be there to build us up, and politics should be there to keep us rooted to the ground. Unfortunately, extremes will spawn in both departments, and then it throws everything off. But honestly, there is no reason why we cannot work together um, 
you know, and, and, and be able to enjoy the diff- what the different worldviews have to offer. Um, so, you know, for me, I'm just as comfortable in a Buddhist temple uh, or Hindu temple as I am in a Catholic church. I'm just as comfortable. Sometimes I'm even more comfortable because then I don't have to worry about the expectations of my own religion infringing upon my spiritual experience. I can just be free. Um, so, yeah. No, no, you know, no. I, I, no. Now, you mentioned the Hindu temple, and I I visited a Hindu temple in Austin, Texas, and I found it, uh, uh, for me, strange because when I went into the temple, uh, the guy at the door was my first time there. He told me to go sit by your God, and there's a bunch of little uh, statues at the front, and and, uh, very confusing for me. Well, you know, the thing is about Hinduism, which I think really throws people in the West, is that... It, it, people see it as the ultimate polytheism, and in reality, it's really the ultimate monotheism. Just people don't really understand how it works. See, all of these deities, when they say, oh, sit by your God, um, you know, you have the, the three primary ones, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and then you have, um, you know, Ganesh and, and other uh, uh, various deities that extend down the pantheon of gods, and I think last time I checked there is somewhere be- between 40,000 and 100,000 maybe even more of uh, various identified deities but the reason people see that as polytheistic is because they don't understand Hindu theology which teaches that there is an ultimate God called Brahman of which we are in aspects called Atman and Brahman shines his light into the cosmos and all those rays of light emanate into the various incarnations that make up the pantheon of the other gods. But they're all aspects of the one true God. So in reality, there's only one God, even in Hinduism, Brahman. comes identical to even what Christians teach with their one God theology. And we being made in the image of our Creator, the Bible teaches we're made in God's image, parallels perfectly the idea of Brahman and Atman, of the human being being a, a, a manifestation of Brahman through the its representative form and outward. Um, you know, and so what are these different deities? Well, they're aspects of God's experience. So in in the West, we already have a framework for this, which was what became uh, what was known as the ancient um, uh, paganism. Uh, so you had you know. In, in Roman, in the Roman pantheon, you had a god like Zeus, who's sort of the true ruler god. But out of Zeus, you have, you know, a god of a goddess of love like Venus. You have a god of war, Mars, um, and and these are aspects of God. So the reason that Jew, the Jewish people, who were the first to teach that you should have no god except for the one true God, and why their temple had a pillar without a statue on it, representing that this God is so great and so above all the other gods that he can't even be represented in any way, um, was uh, essentially because um, they saw the pagans as worshipping aspects of God's personality instead of the true God himself. And so in a way, you could say that is a kind of ideology. I mean, I'm sorry, not ideology, a type of idolatry. Let me ask you this question, because uh, in North San Antonio, they had a Buddhist temple, and I visited there as well. And, and I, I accidentally went into the wrong building, and I guess it was some type of meditation building. But as I went into the building, I felt a strong force just just freezing me right where I was at. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that in like their, their meditation room or whatever, but... Um, it was it was definitely an experience there that I'll never forget. Yeah, and and that is something that a lot of people I have talked to, particularly all from the Christian worldview, mostly have experienced from time to time in places like these. And a lot of that has to do with the great amount of power, power spiritual power that is being cultivated in those locations, um, and a lot of modern. Western Christians are not familiar with that energy because it's not being cultivated in their churches. You know, unfortunately, in the West, religion again, like we were talking about earlier, has been trivialized or even simplified down to just core 
convenience. Doing doing religion just to get it done as quickly as one can get it done so that one can get back to life and the things that really matter to them. But that's not the way it is in the East. You know, the people that really work the religion uh, in the East, particularly in Buddhism, uh, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's not even a religion anymore. It's a way of life. It's a commitment that just envelops every aspect of their being. There's, there's raw power to that. And that's what's being cultivated in these places. And so when you're not used to experiencing that archetypally, um, you go in and you, you can feel the resonant disconnect uh, from your vibration to the vibrations in there. And it can be uncomfortable. Oh yeah. A lot of people. Oh yeah, definitely yeah. was powerful experience. Very powerful. I think yeah. what we're I think what we're trying to sort of even or what we try to uh, explain or express to our listeners is again what we had touched on in the show is that there is no easy button for things in life and that covers spirituality religion and I you know I still I'm an empath myself and I don't even think I could take on trying to learn Reiki and I mean I'm not downplaying people that are studying it but I have enough on my plate with just being an empath and uh, I just couldn't dedicate uh, the time or the effort and there's a great fear out there that people may be misled or for you know trying to take an easy way to solve problems that people are being led down the spiritual or paranormal garden path and that's what we try and tell people do your research yeah and see i want to really emphasize also that that applies to every single uh, religion it's not just an aspect to christianity don't think that just because you can go to again the new age bookstore pick up the idiot's guide to neo-paganism and declare yourself a self-initiate of paganism just because you know there's a book that says you can do that doesn't mean that that really works um i don't discount the value and the viability of paganism as a historical worldview that has existed and had power associated with it there's no question about it and a lot of it got integrated into christianity i mean there's no question that um so much of christianity is really basically hellenized judaism um, however, that being said, I mean, even like, like I mean, even right down to the dying God that resurrects, I mean, even that is our themes archetypally that we see in more ancient pagan forms that uh, existed in places like Egypt and, and, and was carried over most likely by Gnostics or, or Sethian Gnostics before, you know, even Christianity existed. Um, but the fact of the matter is, okay, is that commitment is the same. So if you're looking for an easy route, then religion's not for you. You're better off, and it's a lot safer to just be an agnostic or an atheist and just be done with trying. Because what you're telling what you're telling yourself by saying you're looking for an easier religious path is basically saying that you don't want to do the work. And you just want to have you want to have the, 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 the accolades, you want to maybe have some of the titles, maybe you want to have some of the, the, the I don't know, the mystery of it, but you don't really want to do the work that would be required to actually paint any of it. And it doesn't matter if you choose Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or Buddhism, or Hinduism, or Shinto, or Jainism, or I mean, Jainism, Jainism, sorry. Um, you know, any of them, pick, pick one. They all require a lifetime commitment. I and they all require <clears throat> tremendous practice for attainment. Hey Bishop, we are we're running out of time here. I was wondering if, if there was anything that you would like to promote, or you got anything coming up soon, or anything of that nature. Yeah, um, well, I guess the most recent, from the, or the, the, the most current thing that's coming up is that I'll be uh, at the Haunted Museum in Las Vegas with the Ghost Adventures crew shooting the Ghost Adventures Live special this Halloween. Um, which will be airing on the Travel Channel. I don't quote me on this per se, but I want to say it's 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern. But watch for the official announcement from Travel to be sure on that. Um, but it's going to be a live four-hour special, um, and uh, Zach has some very
very uh, intriguing things planned. It's going to be a wild ride, it's inviting professionals in the paranormal field from all over. I want to say Josh Gates is, is hosting. Um, and uh, we'll be there, Sister Mary Stone and I will be there to uh, offer protection and, uh, and, to help, and help to anybody who needs it as a result of the potential of a spiritual attachment or some kind of demonic attack that could take place based upon some of the things that they may or may not be doing. Nothing's been decided yet. I know one of the things on the table is the opening of the Divic box. Um, I know that Zach's not fully decided on whether or not he's going to open it, but I know I want to be there and he, he wanted me to be there. And they do decide to go that route or something. Why well, don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know, know if you realize that. with that box, they, they actually had that box in, a, in, a, in another podcast show, Coast to Coast. It was a radio show, actually. And uh, they, they tried to open the box in there, and the Wi-Fi shut down, the electricity shut down, everything shut down. And uh, Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that was pretty uh, – it's actually – they have a video of it on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, it was pretty interesting to see that happen, where everything just shut down, and and it only shut down where they were actually doing the show at. The rest of the building actually still had electricity, which was rip, which was weird. But uh, we'll definitely be watching you uh, on the show and checking the show out. It's been a while since we've seen Zach's show. Uh, we we do respect them and uh, as paranormal researchers, and uh, we will check out the show. Yeah. Absolutely, and there'll be some other things coming up uh, after that uh, uh, that I think you know the audiences will find interesting. But uh, that's the most recent thing to, to look for, uh, and I'm looking forward to being a part of it. I think it's going to be an interesting evening. Okay, awesome. Well, we appreciate you joining us, taking the time out to uh, join us, and uh, we hope you have a good day and a good rest of the year. You as well. I appreciate uh, being asked to come on the show, and anytime uh, you want to have me back, I'll be more than happy to fit it into my schedule. We appreciate that, and again, sorry for the technical difficulties, but we were really swimming in water, and uh, we are so blessed that you were able to join us on the show today. Well, I'm happy we could make it work some way, and you have my prayers out there. I hope nobody got hurt. No, no, well, four people are actually miss, missing in Junction, Texas, but uh, you, you, there, there hasn't been a lot of media coverage on it. They've been talking about Florida, but uh, Texas got hit pretty hard, too. So. Oh, well, well, you have all my prayers. I uh, appreciate it, Bishop. You have a good one, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Take care. So that was Bishop Brian Olet. Uh, his show is called Vestiges After Dark. He will be with Zach and the gang on Ghost Adventures Crew on the Travel Channel. Travel Channel, I believe he said that was mm -hmm. Halloween. Live yes. on Halloween? Yes, that'll be live on Halloween. And uh, he wasn't sure at the exact times. He was thinking 8 p.m. to about 12 midnight, but uh, at the Haunted Museum in Las Vegas. And uh, very exciting to be on hand in case uh, protection blessing is to be needed at that particular time. And I will tell you that he reaffirmed what we were saying in the beginning of the show that, you know, yeah, exorcism is just like the first responder. You have to be committed to helping yourself and you do that by seeking God. And so, uh, you know, he does have an open mind about other religious views, which is good. And so, uh, yeah, it was an awesome show. Really and uh, we are, you know, blessed again to have him join us again. Uh, thank you for bearing with us during these technical difficulties. But such is life. You just have to roll with whatever is thrown at you and adapt. Folks, we appreciate each and every one of you. Have a good day. Take care.